Welcome here to the Wine with Jimmy channel. This is a wine channel which is designed to help you out there get more from wine so you can find lots of information to hopefully infuse you about what is in your glass. So we are going to be looking at the wines of Tokai in Hungary in this series. Now this is specifically designed around the WSET syllabus for the diploma level four. It's called the D3 section. So if you are studying, of course, the world of wine, you will make you'll find this very useful. But if you are a consumer who's not studying, you'll find it interesting for all the key information that you will find. So welcome to this se season on Tokai. It is a short but sweet season uh, with seven videos. Excuse the pun there, but I did mean it this time. But it will cover the sweet wines as well as the dry wines. If you have any comments or questions, please do get in touch. You can do so by commenting on this video below. Let me know if you've been to Tokai. Do you like the wines? Do you think they are the wine of kings, the king of wines? Uh, what enthuses you about them, any favourite producers, and so on. In this video, we're going to be looking at climate, soils, and vineyard management. So everything to do with viticulture in this video. Let's start by looking at the location of Tokai. There is a map up here of Hungary. We are drawn to the area to the northeast, which is there highlighted in green. So this area extends from the town of the same name, so Tokai, into the foothills of the Zemplen Mountains towards the Slovakian border, and in fact across into the Slovakian country as well. So it goes across the boundary. So quite famous. Please do remember there are lots of other really exciting Hungarian regions around Lake Balaton, for example, Sopron up here, Eger as well. Uh, so there's lots of exciting stuff to, um, to look at outside of this. But we're just focusing on Tokai, of course. So let's go through its climate to begin. Tokai has a moderate continental climate. Summers are warm and the winters can be quite cold. Rainfall is kind of moderate, moderate to low at 500 to 600 millimetres per year. Um, now, half of this falls during the growing season. Uh, so that's actually quite low. And irrigation, though, is not permitted in this area. Here is the hill of Tokai in all of its glory. Um, now, in terms of the uh, climate also, it's shaped by some very major topography that we can see here on the topographical map. So the region, which is uh, up here, uh, so here you'll see the river Bodrog. I'll talk about that very shortly. So the region is up here in Hungary, and you can see to the north, and then all the way down towards its eastern side, you'll see the very large expanse of the Carpathian Mountains. So the Western Carpathian and the Eastern Carpathian Mountains. Now, this little bit that juts out here is what we call the Zemplen Mountains, which we just talked about earlier. Now, the region gets sheltered from the worst of the cold northerly winds due to these peaks, due to these forested peaks, uh, and the extensive network of our Carpathian Mountains. So it really does create this wonderful natural uh, landmass to protect the region of Tokai. Now, because of that as well, we find some uh, types of altitude and topography here for vines to be planted on. So vineyards are mainly planted on slopes, this helps reduce the risk of winter cold and frost damage, which can be, of course, um, somewhat of a risk in a continental climate, which is considered moderate. The slopes face south, southwest and southeast to take maximum advantage of the sunlight. Remember, we are nestled into that southern part of the Carpathian and Zemplen Mountains. So this means that we have that wonderful amount of aspect here for ripening. Um, 
We're talking about the latitude here as well. So here, another map of Hungary. And I've highlighted the areas between 48 North and 49 North in terms of latitude. And of course, this covers most of sort of uh, Northern Austria. Uh, in fact, what we call the lower Austrian section. So the Niederstreich, most of Slovakia, but then our Northern parts of Hungary, which of course, is important again for our um, Tokai region, which falls here. So we are mainly around 48, but extending towards 49 in terms of latitude. And this means, of course, we are very northerly, which means due to the Earth's tilt, we find during summer long sunshine hours between 1400 and 1500 hours, which means we have a great opportunity for ripeness. And then, of course, we've got the proximity to more topography in the forms of river. Uh, now, autumns here are nice and warm and dry, providing the ideal conditions for, of course, botrytis and the shriveling of the grapes. The two major rivers, the Tisva and the Borog, uh, which I've identified here on the picture, you actually see the confluence here where these two meet. You'll find that I've actually got the map here as well. So you have the wonderful meandering Bodrog River. You can see it meanders its way all the way down here. And then that comes round here near to the hill of Tokai and it empties into the Tisva. Uh, and the Tisva continues to the south of that. So that's exactly what you are seeing here on your picture and your map. Now, the Bodrog River that meandering river, which feeds into the Tisva, floods regularly, creating shallow marshes and water meadows. The moist air from this results in frequent morning fogs, and that's in autumn, and that's the ideal starting point for Petriatus. But then, of course, those warm, sunny afternoons control the development of Petriatus and they limit grey rot. So we, of course, therefore get noble rot as a result. It's really a wonderful um, epicenter for noble rot. The geology, of course, here is a real huge factor in a point of difference for Tokai as a region. Really, Tokai is a region of hundreds of extinct volcanoes. So, of course, the underlying bedrock of this area is volcanic and very deep. It's then overlaid by a complex variety of soils. I put a few up there, by the way, obsidian, which is that wonderful, shiny, dark volcanic rock, andesite, rheolite, both the layered form and then also the tooth form towards the bottom, jasper and also quartz available there as well. Now, the most significant, which is not listed on that left-hand side, is one called Nierok. And this is a volcanic soil which is said to produce the most powerful wines. I've scribbled it down here that you can see. Now, the soft volcanic bedrock means that vines can root very deeply, making water stress and nutri nutrient deficiencies actually quite rare in this area. Also, the rock is quite ideal for excavation. So it's ideal for digging the cellars, which are widely used around the region, of course, to make wine and to store wine. These cellars are famous for this wonderful gray, black, really sort of frothy uh, mold that growth, uh, the, the covers, sorry, the, the whole cellars. And the fungus is called Zasmidium cellari, and it's previously called Cladosporium. It's believed to help regulate humidity in the area. So you'll often see um, very much these kind of like black um, kind of um, spongy molds all around the cellars. Uh, and of course, when you've got the bottle staying down there, you've got these wonderful spongy molds all over the bottles as well. Um, further soils that we find here, there is also Los soils, which is a sandy silt with a high clay content. This is found particularly around the Tokai Hill 
which you've already seen a couple of pictures of. That's to the west of the town. This is thought to produce lighter and more delicate wines. The low topsoil on and around the hill of Tokai can be often around sort of 20, 25 centimetres deep. And then finally, vineyard management leading to the end of the presentation. Now, traditionally, vines were grown on single posts at a very high density, typically up to about 10,000 vines per hectare. This is still occasionally seen in small old plots, but many of them have been replanted since. Uh, so you see some of the staked uh, situation here. This is actually not the highest density on this one, but you'll still you'll see the, um, the process of staking the vines. But of course, we've had modernization. So most vines now are grown on trellis. You'll see <clears throat> wonderful soil. It's the loose soil on the hills here that you can see that we mentioned earlier. Now, these trellising will use replacement cane pruning or cordon training with VSP at lower densities, typically something like 4,000 to 5,000 vines per hectare. The modern training systems, of course, have allowed for mechanization, though in some instances, of course, mechanization is not what you want because you might have uh, azure berries, for example, like this. So vineyards are still worked by hands in many parts, especially on the steeper slopes. And of course, when you have the harvesting for ashu berries, labor availability is not currently a problem, but possibly could be as in many other wine regions. And a few things on the problems here. So the main disease concerns are powdery mildew and in wetter years, like this picture here, gray rot. Now that, of course, is a lot of wet weather around autumns. And we're saying that that would be gray rot that takes hold instead of noble rot, which is, of course, ri a risky business in many parts of the world producing these sweet wines. But managing the canopy to ensure very good air circulation is particularly important for grapes uh, that are being made into dry wine. And you may find pests such as wild boar and birds Certainly when you've got grapes being left on the vine for longer, this elongates the time running the gambit against such animals like boar, badgers, and so on. And the yields here. So because the ajou berries have shriveled on the vine, yields are tiny, typically two to three hectoliters per hectare. To ensure quality, yields for dry wines are also kept relatively low on average around 30 to 40 hectoliters per hectare. It is possible to have higher yields in warm, sunnier vintages, but in poor years, yields must be controlled to ensure, of course, ripeness. Well, that brings me to the end here of part two, looking at the climate soils of vineyard management. Please do join me for part three. If you want to continue on and uh, listen to the rest of this series, with part three and part five, six, seven, and in fact, previously part one, you'll need to join up to my e-learning portal over at www.winewithjimmy.com. Uh, it is a part of the D3 section, which you could buy as a whole bundle, and it has hundreds of videos, hundreds of videos exclusive to those that sign up. There's also extra resources such as uh, examination questions, flashcards, etc. Once again, any comments or questions, please do get in touch by commenting on this video. Make sure you click like and subscribe whilst you are down there. But until next time, I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Goodbye.